Okay, guys, thanks for being here again. Uh, this is a new edition of IEM Talks, and today we have uh, Wilfred Pimenta de Miranda, or Will, and he's going to be talking about uh, businesses uh, in the smart city, uh, business trends in the smart city uh, sector or space. Uh, this is uh, really important for us because uh, IEM Talks uh, were a bit technical and many people was asking us to uh, go a bit more in the business in the business uh, side so that is why uh, we we will have uh, well today so as usual uh, you can use the youtube chat to to submit questions for will and uh, we will we will see if we uh, probably will we, we will do all the all the questions by the end of will's talk well, we will have a little Q and A there, but if uh, some of the questions uh, is uh, if it is viable to do it uh, when some of the attendees uh, input the question, I will probably interrupt a will to to do that. So that's all, Will. Thanks a lot for for being here today. And uh, whenever you want, you're ready to go. I'm just gonna share your slides now. Perfect. Thanks a lot, Daniel. Thanks a lot for the invitation. And uh, yeah, I look forward to to share a few thoughts around uh, around uh, our work uh, at the IOTA Foundation in smart cities, but also share some uh, some personal views on, on on some of the work we've been doing and, and what are the sort of the trends uh, around it. So some of uh, you know what I will be sharing is is a personal view, really based on some of our experience uh, on the field. Um, some of you may not know who I am, so I'm Wilfried Pimenta. People call me Will at the foundation. Um, I'm located in Oslo, in Norway, and I've been uh, with the foundation uh, since early 2017. Uh, so quite early uh, in uh, in the development of the, the ecosystem, and I've been involved uh, as business development director to engage with uh, the external world, so the, the partners uh from the enterprise and, and startup world um, and throughout our work we have been exposed to uh, some smart city projects and some of which are taking place in norway and so in that uh in that context i i have some experience worth sharing and i'll, I'll try to broaden the the thought around what could be the general trend in smart city so let's get going um for some of you that may be very new to IEN or are looking at us uh, on YouTube for the first time, um, the IOLA Foundation is a non-for-profit. We're based in Berlin and we are about 110 employees now in 23 countries. And what we do is to develop a new distributed ledger technology um, that is not a blockchain, so it's a different one, uh, but it's open source and seeks to, to overcome some of the limitations of blockchains in the IoT space in particular. Um, there's three ways to look at IOTA. Uh, we can look at IOTA as a global team. Uh, a lot of our colleagues are in basic research, uh, translating this into engineering code and development. Um, we have some uh, uh, partners um, and colleagues looking at applied research and innovation. And increasingly, we are delivering technology uh, integration support to our partner ecosystem. And we are mainly known out there as the tech. So that's the tangle and everything that comes with it when it comes to added modules, open source, and so on. Uh, we have the different specificity. I'm not necessarily going to pitch the tangle itself in this presentation. I will just assume that you know most of the, 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 the generic uh, attributes. Uh, and uh, we can share some other presentations to, to learn more about the te technology itself. Um, but IOTA increasingly also thanks to the IEN is known for its ecosystem. And there's a broad range of, of uh, community members. The IEN is very much a community uh, activity with developers and more and more business mindsets. Uh, but we have uh, uh, corporates, uh, so enterprise from both public and private uh, involved. Uh, we have startups and academic partners as well. So that was just for the, the, the bigger picture of IOTA. And I'm going to start going a bit towards the smart city context and explain why smart cities are actually pretty important in our work. 
Uh, as you know, we are involved in different industries or smart industries. So those are verticals uh, that are increasingly exposed to IoT. And they are uh, under transformation. Uh, there's new digital services being set up, but more and more we see the entire value chain being reorganized. Um, and to some extent, blockchain or DLT contributes to disintermediate some of those parties. Uh, so mobility is a big sector for us. Also, uh, IOTA Foundation being registered in Germany. Uh, we are close to some of the largest industrial players in the automotive industry. And I recall already back in the late 2016, uh, some of our first interactions on POC uh, were done in relation to the automotive industry. Uh, so that has been kept growing and the mobility sector has shown different potential in mobility as a service, e-mobility, the link to e-charging and electric mobility. So I'll talk quite a lot about this uh, as examples. Um, we have other uh, domains that started to, to grow into the smart city context, like energy, e-health. Supply chain is very also uh, relevant when it comes to logistics. And so a smart city is, is a broad range of, of application domains, uh, but it's mainly a location. So the city is actually a real uh, environment where we're going to innovate. And one of the specificity, as you can see in the picture here, is that you have people. So a difference you have between smart cities and industrial IoT, that is still mentioned here in the slide, is that in that context, we are really here to serve the individuals. So the citizen is at the heart of our attention. At the end of the day, we need to bring benefits to the citizens. And that actually makes a big difference with the world of industrial IoT and automation where you would then contemplate things like uh, smart factories and where the, the end game is probably to reduce the costs by bringing a lot of automation and, and robotics in order to remove the interface with the human. And so that's a fundamental difference. And you'll see through my presentation that I'm really bringing a focus on the human. And that has been a big learning for us considering we're coming from the tech. Most of the smart city context is all about the human and the citizen. Uh, the technology itself, uh, most of you know already about it. For those of you that are new, um, the technology is open source. It's scalable. It's fee-less, permissionless. It fits the IoT M2M, and it's low energy in terms of footprint and uh, electricity requirements. And when you work in the municipality context or smart city, depending on our audience and, and often the audience will be like that, that type of slide is not really good. This is a lot of technical jargon that nobody relates to, and people just don't understand what this is all about, because most of the people in municipality context, of course, they have IT and very clever people, but in order to drive true innovation in the smart city context, we need to talk about something else than technology, at least not at first. And so maybe innovation in the smart city context looks more like this. So we need to bring forward some, um, some, some images and some innovation that talks to people. And there are some trends that I wanted to, to share with you. I'm sure some of you are already exposed to this. Sometimes you recognize those trends also within given verticals. And so you know, sometimes people talk about those Ds, you have three Ds or four Ds. Those are the big trends or digitalization. This is not so much a surprise. Decentralization is an interesting one. We talks a lot uh, to us, and let's say in our IoT and DLT bubble. Uh, we think, of course, it's all about decentralization from a, a node perspective and so on, but it also makes sense from a smart city orchestration and who is going to govern the innovation um, and who is going to participate to really shaping the future smart city. Um, you have, of course, a big push towards decarbonization. And the idea of democratization is also making its way. So we need to provide big access to innovation to, to many people and make all this innovation as much citizen-centric as possible. This image that you see here is a, a modern building uh, from Entra. It's a, a property owner in Norway called the Powerhouse. Uh, this is a, 
a site where we have done some showcase uh, last year, uh, last summer. So taking a, even a broader perspective around the trends, uh, you recognize those 40s I just mentioned, but citizen-centric innovation is really a big push. People in the smart city domain have been talking about this for quite some time, but more and more, I mean, it, it making, it's making advances. And as a lot of public grants and policies are being put in place, we start to see the orchestration of innovation really around the citizen. And what we do needs to be serving a, a, you know, a user experience and benefits. Uh, but as all this is orchestrated through IoT and a sort of digital framing, we need to respect the personal data. And e-privacy is increasingly becoming a big challenge. So some of you may have been exposed uh, in your innovation uh, with IOTA through this problematic. But that, that had came actually, uh, I recall, in IOTA uh, quite early on. Um, at some point, we did a, the data marketplace uh, proof of concept. It was also an open initiative. And we started to look at, for instance, uh, the vehicles as a, as a data marketplace. And our early discussion with the automotive industrial quickly pointed out that, you know, unless we actually gain access to personal data, it's going to be very hard to serve the vehicle as a data platform and related mobility as a service. So all this innovation tends to be real time. And the more real time we go, the more data at fine granular <laughs> um, level we get. And since this needs to serve our purpose, we really are exposed to personal data management. And as uh, many of you uh, know, GDPR, uh, the regulation coming from Europe has been put as a standard for everybody to, to respect and comply to as basis for innovation. So we need to really tap into this and address this properly. So I'll, I'll talk about this later and how we do this also at IOTA. Um, and more and more, uh, we need to also uh, come up with some innovation that engages the citizen to drive change. And so, for example, it means if you find uh, some mechanics to um, help, for instance, the energy transitions of cities, if we start to put solar panels on the rooftop of each building, we need to really find a way for the citizens to engage and drive the ownership or the, the usage of those solar panels. So getting the citizen involved in doing those things in a broader context, it means also asking the citizens to help shape the future development of those cities. And all those things are actually quite important and, and the, the, the authorities, the municipalities are very sensitive to those value added. And so for us, of course, coming from a technical angle, we need to think cleverly about how we can facilitate innovation serving this. Um, the innovation arena, so that's the, the, the section in the middle, I was pointing out that a lot of this has to do with cross vertical innovation. Um, it's very hard to stay just in your bucket or of your vertical. A decade ago, we could innovate uh, incrementally into a given vertical. I do a, a, an innovation in energy, for example, and so on. Uh, but more and more, those things tend to touch to different verticals at the same time. So smart energy communities, which is a, there's a big push, for instance, in Europe to create those self-sufficient energy districts or neighborhoods. Uh, in order to, to fulfill that vision, you need to work with energy, but you need to work with real estate or smart homes. You need to make sure that electric vehicles are connected to those smart communities so that the solar panel uh, creates energy and is fed directly to the electric charger. I'll give some very specific example around this new field. But here we really see that it's about creating innovation that brings together real estate, energy, and mobility. And there's obviously some consequence about how we build business development and new business models around it. Mobility as a service will be confronted to relatively similar challenges uh, and also looking at the, the human really as a human experience in the middle of this. Um, eventually, when you go and drill down the stack, you go to the level of urban data platform. So municipalities are increasingly looking at how to orchestrate the sharing of data across the city 
uh, to tackle lots of different uh, data from uh, from environment to energy to mobility and so on. And so at that level, we're really dealing with a complete cross silo platform um, that uh, that we can of course help address. Um, smart infrastructure push. Uh, so that's a sort of a concept that is uh, emerging uh, to support this urban data platform. You can look at IOTA also supporting this to create sort of smart infrastructure, a data layer, an IoT layer. And um, increasingly, uh, what municipalities seek to achieve is, is openness and transparency. Uh, they want this to be secured and uh, and tapping into personal data uh, in a consented way, GDPR compliant, and and start looking at decentralized trust. So I'll come back to this afterwards. But this idea is mainly fed from the from the the, the, the concept that um, uh, a lot of those solutions have been provided earlier by proprietary solutions. And so you can come up with a, 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 a private a business and sell your solutions to many different municipalities, which create a huge cost to society. While you could really allow a single solutions to start scaling and being replicated a bit more easily towards all solutions. And then if the cities, of course, empowered and have access to open source code, for example, you can start uh, inviting a lot of other parties to integrate a bit more seamlessly. Uh, so vendor lock-in is, is, is one key trend that we see out there. And there's a lot of different associations and NGOs uh, arguing for this uh, need for open and transparent smart cities. And what are the tools and methods to leverage on? So you have different things. And basically, what I, my point here is, is to really try to have a sort of a, a positioning of IOTA and DLT at a more humble approach, because when we work all together, we tend to be very IOTA-centric. Uh, it's very important that to, to, to keep in mind that IOTA is just one small piece of the puzzle. And so what we do and what we need to deal with, of course, when we work uh, on projects is that uh, the mechanics to, to orchestrate this innovation is leveraging on ecosystem co-creation, for example. So it's putting the citizen in the, in the center of attention, even involving them in the process of innovation and doing this through an ecosystem play. So we need to work with different stakeholder groups all in the room, if possible, and start iterating on doing open innovation. And so this exercise is really not uh, code related, at least not at first, but it's part of the puzzle. It's very important to onboard uh, stakeholders on, in that type of dynamic. Social innovation is very important. And um, when you look at trends, for example, in, in the EU grant, so there's an increasing amount of EU grants being allocated to this smart city transformation, new approach to urban development. Um, and it's not really uh, only about the tech. There's an increasing focus on social innovation and, and human centricity. And of course, there's, there's all the supports on the technology. This is very important for the competitiveness, for example, of Europe uh, in the, the, the global arena. And now you have focus on IoT, DLT, and AI, sort of a magic mix and convergence of deep tech. And this, of course, as IOTA Foundation and IEN, we tend to be more comfortable at first. Uh, business uh, and governance models, this is a, something that comes with enabling IOTA, uh, or innovation based on IOTA. We need to think really about how is what is the nature of the business models, who creates value, who captures the value, and how do we organize a, a collaborative play uh, leveraging on, on distributed ledgers. And in the bigger picture, we're still at the beginning. So there's many stakeholders that just don't uh, understand yet how a blockchain governance-based um, model can really be uh, pushed forward. One big uh, concept also uh, that is is uh, going forward, and we have uh, uh, had the, the, the privilege to, to leverage on this also through some projects like City Exchange, is the living lab and test bed concept. So there's there's not a lot of things more powerful than being able to access a living lab. Uh, so a real world environment. Uh, in, a, in a district or in a city where you will have real people to deal with. 
because it's at that moment that you really understand the specificity of the city, the real problems to be solved, and also recognize that it is by involving the citizens and the, the, the stakeholders of the community uh, that you, we understand the problems and how to actually resolve the problem. Eventually, they will need to, for example, install uh, IoT hardware uh, with IOTA embedded. And if you go all the way and you are bringing um, a, a digital asset, for example, in a digital wallet, this is bringing a whole new layer. And we really need to help them understand what are the sort of the consequence and, and the benefits of doing that. And so this is again a bit uh, uh, one part that I mentioned, just like the challenges that we see uh, when we get into smart city, at first you may think, okay, we, we get it, the big smart cities, we're dealing with mega cities, they're all dealing with the same problem, a lot of pollution, a lot of uh, congestions, safety issues, and so on. Uh, in reality, each city has its own specificity, and there's many factors that comes into the play, but the real problems that we're going to solve, and so if we're coming in there as a startup or, or an enterprise focusing on an entry, to support an innovation based on IOTA, we need to get to that level of real problem to be solved. And that's going to be local, most probably. So it needs to be addressed locally. So somehow we need to be physically involved. And we need to engage the local community. And so my point here, again, is to say that technology is an enabler. Uh, and we need to, when we work on business development and driving innovation, build a strategy that addresses the other aspects. And those, the human uh, and people centricity, that's for the solutions that need to do that, secure and GDPR compliance, cost efficiency, of course, and open and scalable. And so I think one strong value added of IOTA is this idea of interoperability and openness, and basically serving this idea of no vendor lock-in. And in practice, it's a bit hard, of course, because when you work as a business or with business, you need to still foster a degree of lock-in. Otherwise, uh, you may be uh, a bit challenged on your business case and long-term commercial viability. And many players we are involved with, they are still trying to lock people in. So the whole we're looking at a, a phase where cloud is the big moment. It's a big moment for cloud services now. And you know the whole strategy is about bringing all the, the data from their clients into their own cloud systems. But the future will be uh, a bit uh, more uh, broad uh, in terms of multiple cloud environments being spread. And the question will be around interoperability. And as you know, IOTA is, it can be a strong asset to allow this interoperability between clouds. Um, one way to, to look at the, the engagement, so when you are going to develop your startup solutions and uh, enterprise solutions, um, you can consider this play. So this is also some things that uh, have been brought to us, to us through engagements like City Exchange, is that there's, there's a, an orchestration of, of stakeholders to involve. And so business is one side of it. So for those of us that are building startups, this is where we're coming from, but we preferably should develop processes of innovation that includes those three other buckets. So you have research and education, so typically a university. You have the public administration, and that's going to be the, the municipality, typically. And then you have the civil society and the users. So if you get access to really the participants and the citizens involved, that's, that's even better. So thinking about those four buckets, as you develop your innovation process, that's that's a really good asset. Um, and um, in order to foster that, you may complement your, your technical skills of development of, of your solution with this idea of co-creation. So that's uh, a way to operate open innovation um, together with the, those, those stakeholder groups. And eventually, when you get to an MVP and need to do a testing and a pilot, you're obviously going to look at this environment. So if you find a way to get involved uh, with all those buckets, you may build the trust necessary to move forward. 
And so one example uh, to illustrate all those things I've been sharing is the City Exchange project. So this is a EU project, uh, part of the Horizon 2020 program. Um, I think we're sort of two years in, in, the, in, the pro, in the project now. It has 32 partners um, and provides potentially 11 test beds across Europe. Um, the way it works is that we're going to develop some solutions, mainly in Trondheim in Norway and in Ireland in the city of Limerick. So those are the two lighthouse uh, cities that uh, will, uh, where we will develop and qualify some, uh, some solutions and platforms. And eventually we can deploy this in smaller municipalities in all the other countries in Estonia, Czech Republic, Romania, Bulgaria, and Spain. And so it's an interesting way to sort of grow adoption. In our case, we are, I'll explain a bit what we do. Um, but the main purpose uh, from a sort of consortium play is to co-create positive energy districts. And that's not an isolated project. Uh, there's uh, continuously now some grant proposals aiming at that landscape. Uh, the idea is to, within, in that case, districts or blocks of, of the city uh, to create self-sufficiency so that you have um, buildings uh, that are now creating energies thanks to solar panels. Um, those buildings are able to trade energy with their neighbors. Uh, so building to building or including assets like batteries or electric vehicles and so on. So in the future, you will have a decentralized energy system that can balance itself through its own energy and its own flexibility uh, demand response mechanisms. And so we have interesting parties in there. And what you can notice, of course, is that we have municipalities such as Trondheim Commune. Um, this is the municipality of Trondheim. Uh, you also have Antenu, the university. And uh, in as we innovate, what we do is that we engage with citizens. So a big part of the project actually is not technology related. It's really related to the co-creation process and creating living labs where we have interfaces with the citizens. And that's a visual about that explains a bit what we're doing. Uh, in the past, you had some relatively static buildings, all consuming energy from the central grid. And we're going through this transition, a clean energy transition, following those four Ds that I explained earlier around decentralization, digitalization, decarbonization, and democratization. And what you see that the future is going to be a positive energy environment where you have buildings creating energy for themselves, but eventually excess energy so that they can sell this energy to their neighbors. Um, and you need to orchestrate this uh, through technology as well. So this is where we come in. Um, <coughs> when we look at the, the, the type of solution, I, I'm actually going to give you a snapshot here. This is the, the solution uh, that we are typically contemplating uh, with the partners, where you are going to go from a, a ver vertically oriented uh, system. So you see consumers, distribution, transmission, power plant. This is the traditional system uh, for, of, of the grid and energy supply. And what we're doing is that we are moving into a much more uh, decentralized system where you have different pieces of the puzzle, like uh, wind power, uh, uh, heat, uh, thermal, uh, you will have uh, solar, uh, you have some batteries, uh, you will have the meters, and all this needs to be orchestrated to, in our case, create a peer-to-peer -peer energy system. So that it's going to be a near real-time flexibility market. And to support this, we need to have a sort of digital twinning, and we need to understand what is the situation at uh, at uh, every given moment. So we'll have a frequency of the market and we'll catch all this data uh, together and fed into a model that will determine the price of electricity in a, in a near real time fashion. And uh, we'll be able to then through this, this sort of uh, marketplace engine dictates uh, which energy asset will need to pay which one. So they are sort of trading in real time for energy. And what we see to seek to optimize is the flexibility. So the ability that um, a machine can uh, turn itself on and off. Uh, what IOTA provides in that context, it's data integrity. So 
ensuring that we have a, uh, the same common view on the market situation and uh, the demand and supply. Uh, and we use really the data integrity of the distributed ledger technology. That means we are, are going to um, put at the uh, IOTA different pieces uh, or uh, entry points of the source of the data. Um, uh, we're going to be able to enhance the, the edge uh, through specific energy agents. So we are working on, on, on developing uh, some specific IoT hardware that will illustrate the, the potential. And we seek to demonstrate a proof of concept uh, stage for the moment, the real-time uh, M2M micropayment. So that's the idea that we could settle transactions in near real time between all those energy assets. So take, for example, two energy meters. One is, is basically reflecting the energy transfer from one building to another and will follow up basically uh, with a payment mechanism in near real time. So in that case, we really have a IoT hardware connected to the meter that will uh, have an embedded wallet holding IOTA tokens. So we're doing this at proof of concept stage. Uh, and hopefully, as we progress, we'll be able to mature the, the solution uh, towards production readiness. Um, I wanted to bring the, the, those type of slides in terms of trying to think about what are the sort of major pain and gains that we are addressing when we, we leverage on IOTA. Uh, so here I'm taking a, a bit of a, a higher perspective on all, all this, um, but we find it very useful uh, to, to illustrate the value added. So in the example I, I provided here about the peer-to-peer -peer energy marketplace in a in municipality or a district, um, the first thing that needs to be fixed is a common uh, vision or common understanding of the situation in terms of, of data sets. Uh, if you orchestrate a marketplace, you first need to have a sort of digital twin, uh, not in visual terms, but really have a, a, the same uh, version of the truth. And this comes into the bucket I call digital trust. Um, this is where you find uh, the value added of data integrity, of security. Uh, and now what we are building is a new layer around decentralized identity and the idea to, to manage privacy. And all this type of value added, so let's call it digital trust. People have different ways to, to qualify it. But as you know, uh, all this can be uh, served by IOTA Tangle independently from any consideration with the IOTA token. The IOTA token is what you find in the second bucket, which is around data monetization, when you're going to think about saying, mm, we need to incentivize economically the exchange of data, and we want to create business models. But before that, when especially when you talk to, to public authorities uh, and urban data sharing platforms, they are first concerned with ensuring security and having a common uh, source of truth. So digital trust bucket is there is very important. And IOTA has the specificity of serving that need without necessarily bringing a cryptocurrency uh, in the play. And permissionless DLTs is very important for scalability. As you know, if you are st stuck into a private ledger, you will not have this idea of scalability and openness that cities want. So basically, permissionless DLT is probably the answer the challenge that some of our, our other blockchains will, will face or probably facing is that they need to always bring a cryptocurrency play always upfront. Even if it's not really about orchestrating data monetization, they need to leverage on or bring forward their cryptocurrency play to, monet to incentivize the miners. So the network needs to be incentivized to function. And that means any kind of deployment will need to have a cryptocurrency story. The reality today is that many municipalities and smart cities are not yet versed to this new domain of innovation. And it's probably clever to come with a first approach and illustrate the potential of IOTA for data integrity and digital trust in general. And as things go forward and, and let's say urban data platforms are orchestrated and new digital services are, uh, are onboarded, at some point, obviously, someone says, how can we incentivize the data sharing? How can I build a business model that is very cost efficient? 
And at that moment, we can introduce the IOTA token that is fee-less and real-time. And if it fits the purpose of this business model, then we have the IOTA token as an option. And being able to articulate the value added of IOTA in that way is, is very appealing uh, compared to other blockchains. So I think that's a, that's a tip for me is to, to try to, to upfront uh, explain this. We are sometimes very fascinated in the community by uh, doing a leap towards complete peer-to-peer uh, tokenized model and so on. But some of the stakeholders we, we deal with are simply not ready. So we just need to read the state they are at and and, and leverage uh, of the this flexibility we have in the IOTA ecosystem. And eventually we will go, of course, towards the right, which is more autonomy. Um, and there you have a lot of new consideration, but this whole sort of approach to automation um, also is, is, is going to be a, bring a, a new layer. And I think that the, in terms of governance, people will need to, to really absorb what it really means. So asking the machines to act on our behalf and, and take decisions automatically. And in, in many cases, that will be related to an economic uh, trading. So there's a whole way, a pathway to illustrate, to explain uh, the consequence of doing this, also from a regulatory standpoint. So it may be clever, or at least that's that's what I often do, is to start from the left and move close step by step towards the right. Uh, and what it means here, uh, the slides will be shared later. I don't think we have time necessarily to go through the whole thing, but this is a, a sort of breakdown of what I mentioned, digital trust, data monetization and automation. In, in, in the energy domain. Uh, and what you can see this on the upper uh, left side, you can start by talking about the IoT digital trust and the edge security and privacy that we need. So we need to really start working on that. And people that are also technical uh, in, in the city context will understand how sensitive uh, this is going to become. And so if you hack the, the edge, you're sort of screwed. Even if you use a DLT, uh, you will have the problem of garbage in, garbage out. We can provide uh, immutability of the data, but if the quality of the data is not good, it has been hacked or tampered with, then there's no point for, for leveraging on DLT. So what we do at IOTA to, to alleviate this risk is that we basically incorporate IOTA into specific hardware and secure elements that will be able to deal with those challenges. And we're now also addressing uh, some of the extra challenges with specific access control and privacy management uh, features. And so that's one of the, the, the aspects around digital trust. And you can use this uh, type of, or you can use IOTA for other things, of course, than just security. You can think about traceability of energy so uh, we can use the, the ledger uh, to trace uh, where the energy is coming from and that it comes from a green energy. Of course, it's, it's, a, it's a development that needs to, to happen on top, but we started to do some proof of concept and showcase in that domain. And when you do this, you don't need, for instance, the token and you don't need to monetize anything. So you can basically uh, start doing this more on the sort of the idea of trust. You can also organize demand response management system to control your assets uh, remotely. For example, if uh, you have an electric vehicle that is going to charge, you could in principle control at which moment um, uh, it's good to start activating the charging. For example, you don't want to charge when the energy price is very high. So we can start thinking about how to orchestrate this, this idea of, of, uh, of control. And then when you move towards the right, you see the different type of use. Then it's all about paying. So you can have the paper use. You can have incentivize sustainable energy communities by tracking uh, the, the renewable energy uh, uh, provenance. Uh, you can create flexibility markets. Eventually, you will have full automation. And then in a full-fledged scenario, you can go towards this idea of peer-to-peer -peer energy trading. Uh, that we are trying to contemplate with a city exchange. For the moment, city exchange is more in a limited test bed environment. And so that, that was a sort of the, 
a bit of, of, of consideration from a, a, a technology standpoint. But here again, that's a slide I wanted to show about the social innovation co-creation process. Again, I think it's super important not to forget that part. And that's a slide, for instance, from Power from City Exchange. And so when we got a grant, you know, that's what people are, are buying into or what the government has supported, the idea of co-creating the future we want to live in. So it's all about bringing the citizen in the center. And then you see in there, you have a whole track related to creating innovation playgrounds, the next generation smart citizen, and so on. And that is as important as the other track, which is looking at creating a common energy market. And this trend, I don't think, is, is going to go. In order to make sense of this new smart innovation in, in the future, we need to link the tech to the citizen. Some specific use cases we worked in uh, uh, in the past. Um, it shows also a bit how we have evolved over time following that trend. Um, some of our partners from, uh, from the Netherlands um, have uh, two years ago created a POC illustrating how uh, we could orchestrate machine to machine payment for charging. So here you see back then there was a mini Tesla they had put in and they built from scratch a full functioning charger that could accept IOTA payment. And the idea is to plug and, and, plug and charge. Um, you have a wallet inside the vehicle, a wallet inside the charger. And as you connect, you have a direct payment for the charging. And as you disconnect the cable, you're already done and the settlement has been uh, done. And that creates sort of seamless experience where you don't actually need to identify yourself. So the driver, you don't need to identify yourself as a client to the charger. This is a pure machine to machine payment, seamless. That would of course open a lot of consideration for interoperability. So that looks very interesting, uh, but it's still very uh, tech oriented. Um, <clears throat> so bringing a, a bigger picture uh, around it, and when you think about the ecosystem, uh, some some stakeholders like Jaguar and Rover, that is one of our partners, started to develop a car e-wallet, and that's what you're going to start seeing in the future. So thanks to their car e-wallet, the vehicle can now share securely information with its environment and different stakeholders, and can consider monetizing this data sharing. And you could basically combine the car wallet with the smart charger. And so when you put those two things, that looks really great, but you will still need to bring a, this into a real world environment where you can start demonstrating the potential. And eventually that's what we thought we should probably try to orchestrate. So what we've done is we did a, a process of innovation and we linked all those parties together, including City Exchange because we had access to a test bed where we could get started and expand from. And what we've done is we illustrated how a car e-wallet linked to a smart charging case and adding a new feature, what we call energy traceability, we could provide the notion of green smart charging. And there's some nice videos that have been posted earlier where you see that in practice, you would sit on your vehicle, uh, you would have a dashboard, that provides you with the option to pay directly from the vehicle and you could select green smart charging and what it would do is that it would ensure that payment is done to a source of energy that is green we could even consider new features around the the, the provenance in terms of geography so if people would like to create specific sort of certificates that of origin from the local community we could probably reflect this into the system that was done just on a showcase level, so it's not production ready, but it's here to illustrate the, the potential. And that was done in a real environment connected to this awesome building here that you see that I was talking about earlier, which is a positive energy building, so it creates excess energy. So the potential in smart cities is actually quite broad, as you could see here. Uh, this is a sort of cross silo, right? It's like there's a car, there's a building, it's about energy. At the end of the day, you start to wonder really uh, what's, uh, what vertical it's into. 
And you have a lot of, uh, of different verticals worth looking into with IOTA. So mobility, logistics, and supply chain, they need to be more efficient and be decarbonized as well. Um, energy, as I mentioned, real estate, so smart buildings is a whole domain of, of, of relevance, uh, and climate environment in general. So I'm a bit influenced, of course, from what I see day to day sitting in Oslo. Uh, Norway is a... Uh, is a leading nation when it comes to, to digitalization and sustainability. So most of the innovation coming out now uh, is, is always related to this domain. Smart city is very important. We don't necessarily have mega cities, but we have uh, medium-sized cities, which also allows us to innovate faster. Uh, and that's something to account for, uh, for those of you looking at startups. Um, uh, and, and different solutions, it may be very tempting to go to the big mega cities because it's a bigger potential, but you will face more uh, competition. And it's very hard to trigger this idea of co-creation. So bringing all the parties inside uh, a single room in order to innovate. This slide is a, is a bit more busy, but I, I wanted to sort of uh, help segment a bit the market. And so you see different pieces of the puzzle where we can start orchestrating some, uh, some innovation. You have this whole big mix of different verticals here on the left. And then you have something that is more related to the real world environment too. That's worth considering. So you have a different prey towards the private market and towards the commercial markets. And you see those different steps. I was thinking, to the, how can we orchestrate those buckets in order to really think about the value added? And you have the citizens that lives in a home, that lives in the neighborhood or community, right? And then when it comes to the commercial market, you have tenants, you have real estate, you have a district, you have a city. And being able to, or, to understand the different dynamics and different segments, I think that's that's very useful. And there will be a big difference between uh, those different buckets. Uh, if you stay on the left side and you're really dealing with a citizen, you will need to deal with GDPR compliance and all this privacy management that I mentioned earlier. And if you stay on the, on, on the right, you may have some opportunities to, at the beginning, not to necessarily deal directly uh, with this sort of personal data uh, challenge. And uh, what you see in circle here are sort of different sort of buckets uh, of innovation you may consider. You have, of course, the B2C human-centered digital services. So here you're really thinking about a consumer uh, in front of you, but you will have the shaping of, uh, of decentralized platforms and marketplaces um, to orchestrate uh, different B2B. Uh, and depending on your model, you go, go directly to sort of marketplace to citizen. Uh, and of course, we have at IOTA developed some interesting marketplaces, decentralized marketplaces that you can take as a basis uh, for, for developing those solutions. And if you, if you dive deeper uh, towards the municipalities' interests and cities, uh, they are going to really look at open and transparent urban digital infrastructure. And when you go to that level, the play is a bit different. So. Um, one of the reasons is that in order to, to ensure this, uh, it becomes a sort of uh, critical infrastructure. And, and what I've uh, noticed, and, and many uh, partners have probably seen the same, is that when it gets to really ensuring the, the critical infrastructure of the city, and which is part of the nation, uh, they want to get more control. And so there you may find a, a, some more closed uh, environment to deal with where, for instance, they would not maybe in some case welcome private players to provide the cloud services. So I was traveling in Asia um, uh, last year also and talking about all this uh, challenge. And clearly, uh, some public authorities were saying that they were building their own uh, cloud systems when it comes to the critical infrastructure. And uh, and private players like, uh, like the Amazons and Microsoft of this world, they would basically be able to address the needs more on the digital service layer, but not necessarily on the core, core urban data uh, infrastructure side. And so as part of that play, we need to see basically how we bring our technology to use. And being a non-for-profit and open source technology helps to be leveraged also on that level. 
And so this is a way to illustrate this. So this is a slide uh, I took from a recent presentation I saw from Singapore uh, authorities that are developing a, a, an open smart city platform. So this is not unique to Singapore. There's many uh, other cities that are looking at the same thing. And then you see the orchestration, the multiple layers of development. And sometimes when we think about innovation, we are we are the top. Uh, we are around here. We talk about smart grids and so on, but it's important to understand all those different layers. And what they're currently doing, for example, in Singapore, is to to look at the open digital platform layer. And this is where obviously they're going to gain a control over this. But they're also looking at how do we develop this further to bridge this to the level of innovation and digital services where startups operate. And so this is, a, I think, a very interesting development that we will see in many different cities where they want to develop this uh, as sort of open digital platforms. And then you have different questions that uh, appears, like who governs the design, the development, and operations? And I think that will probably depend on which layer you operate. Um, who is here to uh, ensure the security, of course, from A to Z? Uh, you know, who, uh, how is personal data managed in compliance with the regulation? And that will be, of course, a big challenge if you are going to work in the open landscape A to Z. And eventually, how to incentivize the sharing of data across all those silos. And so this is where the data monetization and the IOLA token will come into the play. And so that's another way to sort of illustrate what we, we just looked at uh, from an energy perspective. So at the, the bottom of the stack, you have the built environment, the physical infrastructure, and you put the hardware. You have a middle layer where you have all those open digital data platforms and marketplaces. And then you will eventually have the digital realm with the, the service and, and different softwares. And when you develop a solution, like here in energy, you see the different ones, peer-to-peer -peer energy and so on. You are really trying to go across the whole, uh, all the layers. And IOLA will be leveraged as a bridge to all those layers and silos. So that's something to, to keep in mind, is that we can leverage really IOLA as an interoperability layer and cross-silo trust layer. Uh, I think I'll pass on, on this. Uh, our, we talked a lot about um, the centricity around uh, the citizen that uh, needs to occur and how do we deal with personal data. And so I'd like to, to, to end up with a few slides a bit uh, around this. Um, some of you have noticed we have developed a, an app called Cell and it's leveraging a, a new unified digital identity platform or, or scheme that we are developing. And in the blockchain space, it's often referred as self-sovereign identity. But in our case, we're going to, to, to go further because we will be able to provide uh, machines and connected devices and identity as well, which will be very important for orchestrating uh, automation. But what we've done recently is to, to develop uh, an, an app. So this is actually something you can uh, uh, play with also um, on your mobiles. It's called Cell. Um, and it focuses on empowering the citizens to, to control their data in the, in the domain of e-health. And we, we utilize this uh, to, to illustrate what we could do in coping with the, the COVID-19 uh, difficulties. Uh, to basically, you know, for instance, illustrate that you are uh, you're clean, you are, in the future we'll be able maybe to vaccinate ourselves and we'll be able to, to, to provide this information through our own control leveraging on the decentralized identity system we have. Uh, and this is a sort of an answer when you think about it uh, to all those contact tracing apps that have made the news uh, in their breach uh, of e-privacy and GDPR. And so this type of app will be very powerful because it will be based on the proactive consent of data sharing from the individual itself. So it's a huge potential and this platform is not meant to be a solution IOTA provides directly to the market as a sort of B2C, or, but we are going to invite the parties to continue developing the solution and, and bring it into uh, the public authority schemes um, that wants to utilize it. And I'm showing this because you can see or you can think about how to leverage on this development towards a smart city context. Of course, today you could think already about how to to bring a safer environment 
uh, for instance, if you could utilize this type of app uh, to access a specific office or a co-working space or a specific shop in the future if uh, the COVID-19 situation doesn't resolve itself. Um, but it can be applied to a lot of other contexts, broader and beyond the smart city, of course. It also shows that e-health, again, is very important. And when we think about smart cities, it's all about the citizens. So uh, e-health is, is going to be uh, an important uh, sector to consider for us. Uh, and to go further into that direction, uh, this week, we also announced a new cooperation uh, with the University in Oslo. Uh, that's the, the largest Norwegian university um, and the, the, the Department of Informatics will be working with us to research uh, our new uh, decentralized digital identity scheme and the personal data sharing challenges attached to that and GDPR compliance I mentioned earlier. And so that's something I look very much forward to. They will set up a, a, an IOLA Tangle network on the campus and will be able to invite external parties uh, from both private and public to come and start innovating with us and apply for different research scheme. And the University in Oslo will also join the Tangle E, where you can also find a digital identity uh, working group uh, being set up there and where we have started to aggregate different parties to innovate together on specific themes. And so that's a very interesting uh, part that really will help bring focus on the citizen and the human as part of the smart city transformation. Yeah, I was uh, probably going to wrap up a bit um, now. Um, maybe one last part. This is a way to illustrate a bit the, the, the whole pitch I gave you. Uh, so that illustrates the process we've gone through uh, to bring this uh, showcase uh, in your name. Um, it taps into open innovation and this idea of agile public-private partnership. So the, you know, it's not easy to orchestrate, but that's something uh, that is probably necessary if you want to have a high impact. So here you see the picture of many of the partners. So it's not like all the logos were there in the room, but we had uh, quite a few of them, including partners uh, that were from the community, like local shops. And we innovated together during two days to create different proof of concept potentials. And what you see behind you, behind the, the picture, uh, we're in Trondheim, that's in the winter, but you have actually the district where we're going to operate the city exchange project. So we're really locally involved and we were figuring out different proof of concept we could show on top of the city exchange. And we came up eventually with this idea of the traceable energy with the Jaguars, where eventually we had two vehicles on site connected to the building. And what we've done is to showcase the, the prototype um, to, to, do, to gain more confidence around the parties to show how we, we can innovate together. We gain exposure also through the media. And the process, of course, helps develop the ecosystem. So what started with a minimal viable ecosystem is starting to grow into a broader ecosystem. And as this, this develops, of course, there's more facilitation, coordination work uh, to be uh, set up. And so we're looking at the best and most efficient way to start orchestrating this. But it will take a lot of multi-stakeholder engagement to start transforming a smart city and bringing IOTA at all those layers. Um, here, there's some, my last slide is just some, some takeaways of my presentation. Uh, and for some of you that are on the early stage of, of, of shaping your startup and are maybe um, do not necessarily have all this experience that some of the senior people have, um, I just collected those thoughts that can help maybe structure a bit the process. Um, but when in our domain of IOTA, it's, it's, it's important to really think cleverly uh, up front around the audience we are addressing. And when we work in the smart city, you have a lot of different type of stakeholders. And if those people are not necessarily technical, you really need to soften the edge. And when you pitch IOTA, you need to really have a different approach that they illustrate here. So think very hard about what is the KPIs, the key performance indicators of your audience, and what are they here for and what are they trying to serve and how can you really help those people? And uh, when you start to work in a smart city context, this may not be around the technical edge to begin with. 
So you need to wrap up things a bit differently. So start with the why and the problem to be solved. And very often it will need to be locally anchored. And try to avoid to jump in directly in what you want to provide and how. You should probably try to really contextualize your pitch and really think about the problem to be solved first. And try to qualify it really uh, by having different interactions with stakeholders before. And uh, focus on the benefits to the citizen. So in the end, if it's really a smart city context and, and the public authorities will also be involved, it's all about the citizens. So we need to translate what we do eventually in value added for the citizen. Even if you're in a B2B, we need to provide, I think, a citizen centricity at that level. Um, um, one thing that is very tempting to do is to pitch the tech, including Iola, and we're super happy <laughs> if you do that. But you shouldn't pitch the tech uh, directly up front. You should really wrap it up into a solution. And a solution is something that solves the problem they have, and it's wrapped up in something they can deal with as a process. They know that they can hire you. right? They can't hire tech, but they can hire you to deliver the solution. And all this is super important to wrap it up in a proper solution. It seems to be obvious, but sometimes we're very tempted in our domain to just come up with a technology that will resolve all the problems. Very uh, often, the stakeholders are not able to tackle technologies. They know that technology is just an enabler, and they have been completely bombarded in the past years with a lot of technological pitch that would save the planet. And so now they're very aware that they're looking for solutions that fits the problem to be solved. So make sure that you focus on that. Once you're at that level, <laughs> you can then leverage on IOTA, pitch it, and, and, and demonstrate how the transparency and open source and all the ecosystem potential can come into the play. Um, and of course, where it's needed, so that depends on your profile and what you're trying to achieve. But the IOLA Foundation uh, may be uh, able to support or engage uh, with some of your projects. And because the, the ecosystem is so broad and we have so many uh, startups, we are not able to provide support as many uh, of you have experienced. Uh, for, for early stage uh, startups, it's just too difficult and we don't have the capacity. Uh, inside the IOLA Foundation. Uh, so the IEN is super important for this in order to, to make a sort of a bridge to the community and, and spread the, the words. But at some point of the journey, of course, um, you realize, especially if you follow some of the principle I, I, I showed here on Smart City, is that you're going to have a minimal viable ecosystem. So actually what you have is not only a startup or a new project, it's, it's an ecosystem, including viable, credible, established players. And if you are able to, to bring them together in a sort of coalition or consortium that have access to, to a preliminary pilot or test bed, this looks, to, this starts to, to shape uh, a quite impactful uh, opportunity. And then you should definitely talk about this to the IOTA Foundation to see how we can ensure the success of your project. And on our side, what we're increasingly uh, looking at is how do we bring those ecosystems together in the context of test beds and granted projects. So we are looking at different national and international European grant schemes to see how we can shape uh, those coalitions. Yes, I've been talking a lot. Uh, I hope it was meaningful. Um, I'm happy to take your questions and uh, clarify also a few things. Okay, Will, thanks a lot. Yes, that was amazing. I really love the, the last part in which the, you, you gave a lot of very good advices for startups trying to, to pitch and to get in contact with companies or, or governments. So yeah, we have some questions. Um, if you wanna go back to, your, to the backstage, uh, you will be able to, to read the questions on, on the screen the screen yeah thing. so let me check well let's go with this one from Gabriela Jara so Gabriela is asking um, Ayala is going through a lot of changes and it will continue doing so until 2021 how can companies use a protocol that is changing that much so uh, I mean the, the information is always uh, available up there, and then we can continuously, you know, uh, my colleagues can 
can facilitate uh, the clarification around this. But I understand that you're afraid to maybe be locked in on developing now, and that's something that wouldn't work afterwards. But I think there's a degree of continuity into this. Some of my colleagues are probably better placed to, to explain that. Um, but you can, uh, with the Chrysalis upgrade also that we're going through now, uh, you will have a lot of the good basis uh, for the future. But uh, it's, I think the, um, some of my colleagues uh, maybe better to, to go into the details. So I think it depends actually on which module or functionalities you may be leveraging. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so uh, follow-up question is from uh, Juan Kitegi. Uh, he's asking if the companies are more interested in the IOTA da data layer than the value token. Yeah, and so I think so in the smart city context, uh, I, I would think so. Um, and if you extract even IOTA from the equation and you look at what is happening globally, of course, people talk a lot about DeFi maybe and cryptocurrencies and so on. But if you if you look at enterprises and what they are focusing on, there's a lot of focus on private blockchains, right? They get, often they actually say an enterprise blockchain is a private blockchain. They have sort of mixing for some reason the possibilities there. Um, and then you don't have any token involved. And so one of the reasons is that they, uh, they are leveraging on this idea of digital trust. They are reorchestrating the data exchange in consortia. And that's the sort of a lot of the play that is happening there. And it's important to understand that some of those enterprises, it's difficult for them to go completely permissionless uh, because they think they're going to lose the control. Right, so a company, private company, is all about competitive advantage. And so what they've done with blockchain on the short term is say, how can I still build a competitive advantage, something I have but others don't have? So what they've done is like, okay, well, I'm, I'm going to set the standard and I'm going to build an ecosystem I can still control to some extent. That's why you have all those private blockchains that have been set up. And it's a transition I think my point of view is that it's only a transition because eventually this is all about opening up and eventually you will have permissionless ledgers to bring the trust in a much more broad scale. Um, and so this is just, you know, uh, what, what is happening. So in the smart city context, um, the token will only be leveraged if you have the data layer. Okay. You know, like it, it's very, uh, you, you will probably not have marketplace. You know, marketplace needs to have the data layer in place before orchestrating the token, right? Because you're monetizing the data layer. Yeah, so yeah, of course. Today, today, they are starting with the data layer. And then we need to work it out and explain the, how the token is going to function and how the governance is going to be orchestrated around it. It depends on the case. Yeah, totally. But if, if you if you don't have the support for the data for the data, then you don't have any any use for the token. So the, the idea is to to use the token as a mean of exchange per data. So yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So uh, let's go with this question. Uh, this one is from uh, Nicolas. He's uh, working on circular energy management. And he's asking, uh, we're working on a renewable energy charging station network for micro-mobility vehicles, like scooters and e-bikes. Do you know any IOTA Foundation partners for cities that might be interested in running a pilot? Yeah, this is a project using IOTA, by the way. Uh, I don't know if you know this project. Uh, it, it was, uh, it, it got the third prize at the IOTA Perfect Brainstorm Contest. Okay. Uh, so today, I mean, we, I'm, I'm on, on the continuous basis uh, networking with uh, this environment of stakeholders, of enterprises and, and municipalities. And uh, it's a work in progress, basically. And it's not like we have off the shelf a permanent uh, amount of, of cities to go through. Some are starting to open and we had some very fruitful discussions and we have some uh, some agreements basically with um, the city of Trondheim, for example, that has a, a new center of excellence on, uh, on SDGs for smart cities uh, that are opening up uh, the idea to develop more synergies on that front. 
And so here we have dialogues, but it's going to be settled on a project to project basis. We don't have one steady test bed where we can bring everything on. So it's something to work out. And usually uh, what I sense uh, is the barrier or is the condition to, to act is uh, access to funding. So it depends on, on you guys for if you need funding to catalyze your thing, but we'll have to wrap this up into a grant project typically, especially when it deals with smart cities. The cities themselves do not necessarily have a, a large amount of budget to spend on innovation. And so we need to get their support, engagement, and so uh, to, to, to open up the gates and access to test beds, but we need to have grants. And so that's why I encourage you to look at all the different sort of grant scheme out there. So it depends on which country you are in. And you have also some European schemes. Uh, and then you need to filter out. So in the domain of energy, you have, uh, for instance, new rounds around, for instance, what we secured for uh, the city of Trondheim. So positive energy district is a concept by itself. And there's upcoming uh, grants that are going to be submitted. And there the play is to find your partners. And of course, we can think about, and I don't know actually at which stage you are at, if you're a startup or more advanced, but we can discuss, I can try to think about the, about this. And there's, of course, some confidentiality to some of the dialogues we have with some of our enterprise partners that are interested generally in the topic. Um, one thing I noticed again, and I think that sort of validates also the, uh, the, the thing is that some of the enterprise partners are also into this from a research perspective. Um, and so if you are able to link your project to an academic angle and to a research, it can be a positive because then there's, you can wrap this into a research related collaboration. And then you can have like considerations for PhD supports and all those things in this domain is, it's quite important to, to look at that side. But, uh, in very practical terms, I'm happy uh, to, to talk to you so you can uh, send me an email and I can try to, to learn more about your project and look at synergies. Cool, cool. I'm going to put you in contact with, with Nicolas. I actually, he, he's part of our IR Argentina community cluster thing. And so I can, I can just provide him with your email. And then uh, we, Gabby did another question. We sort of covered this, but yeah, how important is for people to acquire IR tokens? Uh, is the adoption of IR technology by companies more important at this stage of the project or are both important? Yeah, we sort of covered this with the data layer and the token thing, I think. I think she's, she's uh, asking if how important it is for IORA Foundation uh, to have people acquiring the tokens. Uh, yeah, our, so, so I mean, so, some, of the, some of the capital that, uh, that the foundation has access to is, uh, is an IORA token. So as any player in this domain that has IOTA token, the more people want the token, the more it will uh, appreciate. So you will have a better value for the token. And so in the case of the foundation, it will give us strength and more capacity to recruit and pay salaries. So that, that dynamic is, is good for us in a way. So of course, if one single person do, doesn't make big change, but of course we encourage everyone to, to get into, uh, into this. But uh, it's a really, uh, it's an it's a individual choice that you need to make. And we don't control anything about the IOLA token trades, right? So all the IOLA tokens are out there. We just happen to have been provided through donation, some of those tokens back. So um, yeah, at the foundation, uh, uh, Dan um, is our head of financial relations. And so he's also uh, sort of better versed to, to explain all the dynamic around the token and what we're trying to achieve um, around this. Great. Uh, we have another question here from Wellington Silvano. Wellington is part of the Brazilian community. And he's asking about uh, uh, the collaboration between universities and the AERA Foundation. Uh, how do you see that? Uh, so, how do you see in the, in the status or how we should do the play and so on? Um, I think he, he's just uh, wondering um, what's your opinion about uh, the current uh, collaborations between the Aero Foundation and different universities? Yeah, yeah. So I think, I mean, academia is very important. And so uh, at the foundation, we have different 
uh, there's different areas where academia can get involved. Um, you have the, the research, so the core, let's call it core, core research, and universities conduct research all the time. And so as part of core decide, for example, and, and whatever will come uh, afterwards, because there's going to be some continued development, uh, we are super eager to develop relations with with PhDs and research on that. And that's really core research, right? So we're far from the innovation domain about thinking about the applied research and what it means in the real world. It's really core protocol considerations. And we have already established uh, relationships with academics on that front, and we continue to grow the, the relations. Um, uh, there's also a research council that has been set up. Uh, I think there's, there's, you can probably find this information on our website. Uh, but academics are involved and we will grow also the, the arena of academics on, on that front. Um, aside from core research, you have then applied research and then further on you have innovation. Um, and of course education. Uh, so on applied research, uh, this is typically where you have the university in Oslo uh, case that I flagged. So we are talking about a practical application this is around digital identity and how to manage personal data. So we're not talking about only the, the core protocol, we're talking about how it interacts with the citizen in that context. And there we, there's a lot of research, very important to the trans transition to the data economy. Um, and then we can work basically with them. And the, the way it can work is that they can conduct um, research by themselves uh, they have their own scheme at universities to, at least in Norway, it works like that, where they can apply for public grants for conducting research, and they can, if they are educated and, and knowledgeable about IOTA, formalize programs related to IOTA specifically. We can also apply together on some specific projects. And in that case, they can actually even consider subcontracting the IOTA Foundation for doing some piece of the research. It depends really on the scheme. But from what I've learned is that they, they do need to be funded. So each researchers and research team have a, a mandate and they need to apply for, for securing the research. When you move towards innovation domain, you have an industry interest to make innovation come out of this. And this is typically where you have projects like the CT Exchange where in the city exchange, you have NTNU, the university, and it's led by the smart city activities. So they have researchers really conducting social innovation research and technical uh, aspects as well. Uh, and it's funded and we're part of the partners. Um, uh, and uh, so you have core research, applied research, innovation. Um, and when it comes to innovation, uh, this is where you're going to have a link uh, to um, uh, to education. So one thing that we're exploring in different universities is how to leverage on the campus as a test bed. So when you think about smart cities and you get the engagement of the university, it does make sense, right? You could do prototyping using the buildings of the university if you're on a smart building uh, uh, solution. And you do prototyping and you can go and do this even with the involvement of faculty members or PhDs and students. So master students or bachelors can actually get involved in shaping projects. And IOTA can be part of the knowledge base. So we are exploring those, those setups, for example, at NTNU. Naturally, through the project of the City Exchange, everything is sort of being linked and the municipality is also working closely with the university. That's why it's so important. And so the Currently now on the CT Exchange, we are sending IoT hardware that we have designed that is going to run IOTA and will be plugged to specific energy assets. And we are sending it to Antenu in order to be plugged and tested. And that's sort of leverage on, uh, on the smart campus, if you want, as a test bed. And what we seek to, 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 to figure out also is how do we bring this knowledge around IOTA to the university so it can be more self-driven. So faculty members will eventually have a degree of knowledge. Uh, we are looking into uh, being able to sell or package um, some dev kits that would be equipped with some blueprints and you can take this and bring it to the university so faculty members are, can be orchestrating some specific training 
for the bachelors and master's students, etc. And some things that we've seen being shaped already in the past and sometimes completely uh, independently from our own uh, sort of uh, invitation in the first place are projects like uh, Nordic Semiconductor uh, asking uh, bachelor students from NTNU to incorporate IOTA in specific uh, Bluetooth chips and doing a project around it. They, they told us basically afterwards that they had done it. So that's also the benefit of having the, a lot of our material available online so people can actually shape whatever they want. But we, we are generally very interested to support this idea of university engagement. So the recent announcement with university in Oslo is not an isolated case. We are generally discussing with a lot of universities, but there could be a really strong scenario where we can bring a, a network of universities a bit together and to facilitate knowledge transfer. Yeah, that would, that would be amazing for the development of, of the IORA protocol indeed. Okay, so let's take one more question and let's wrap it up because, uh, yeah, we are one hour, 20 minutes right now. So uh, these guys, um, these guys are also from Argentina. I know them and they, they are asking, uh, they are working on a proof of concept related to industrial applications and they want to know if they, ca they can organize a talk with, with you, Will, uh, in order to understand the way that the Diego Foundation analyzes the potential of a project like this. So I think it's a bit challenging for us to, to provide this because it's sort of, uh, that this is where it's, it, it is challenging for us to serve the whole startup community and all the different projects. Uh, this is where we have capacity issue and we hope that, you know, through the IEN uh, <laughs> we could, uh, you know, orchestrate something where we can share the knowledge and provide tips to one another. And I think w one interesting uh, task we should uh, define or put together, uh, Daniel, is, is what could be the criteria uh, for projects to sort of go through so that we can say, or you know, together as a community, you would say, okay, this project has specific features. It's really interesting. And that ticks the box uh, so that you can bring it uh, more visibly to the foundation. Yeah, yeah, that would be awesome. I think that that's the that's challenge. And so, and to put it in perspective, uh, all those requests may come from startups, uh, but it can come from anybody, right? So from enterprises, from people that have ideas. And so the reality is that we have often been bombarded <laughs> in the past by tons of questions. And so it must have been so frustrating uh, to be uh, on that side because you don't get any answers and so on. So we got extremely busy in, in some times. Um, and it's true that uh, we have, uh, in order to focus, what we have done is, is to focus on the larger high impact projects. So all those things where we talk, we tend to talk more about enterprises and smart cities and so on is because it's easier to validate uh, the, the technology and, and the business models around it. And hopefully we can share it back to the community. Um, uh, but you know, I, I think it could be an interesting exercise because it's not like we want to say, no, it, it, it may no. depend on specific criteria. We should just try to define them on, on which circumstance and on context or, or ticking box uh the use case is worth looking into i suppose yeah no and, and definitely the iem uh, works as a, a sort of middle layer here between all these startups and the aero foundation and actually i am uh, working with these guys uh we we are, we are having regular calls we will have one call tomorrow so yeah uh, that is what we are doing or we are trying to do we are trying to engage with this sort of startups and people uh, willing to do things with the IORA protocol to see what they have. And of course, if, if we get to a point in which we think that, that that is a good idea and it could add a lot of value, yeah, we can uh, build bridges between them and the IORA Foundation, but we mm -hmm. can't have everyone talking with the IORA Foundation because you guys just won't be able to, you have an, a very busy agenda and there is no way to, to have that mm -hmm. going on. But I, I see. I see that you know what part of the question is actually. Uh, could we organize a talk with you in order to understand the way the EF analyzed the potential of a project? Yeah. Right? So, if we, so reading that specific question is more about understanding the methodology about what is a good or bad project. So, uh, you know, IOTA itself is not going to be dictating if your project succeeds. So that's the 
one of the things we need to keep in mind is that we are just an enabler, right? So a lot of learnings is done on the field when you're really driving your innovation um, and, and, and where you convince your clients. So, uh, but we could try to look at how to sort of bring together best practices from the best of our knowledge and start to build some hypothesis about, you know, the key, loss, key success factors for a good projects. Yeah. Um, I think w one thing I, I, uh, I've noticed from the engagement uh, in, uh, in IOLA, in GLT, in blockchain in general, in deep tech, um, uh, and also working with academics from business schools uh, that are eager to understand everything. So generally, uh, one of the big challenges we're facing in this whole IoT space in DLT is going back to the basics or that a client, a good project, would result in, in, in KPIs that would look like a return on investment, right? If you're in business, that's going to be an indicator, return on investment. And it's quite, so, it's quite hard for a lot of projects to come up with this clear return on investment. What can you do that the other that the legacy systems couldn't do? And can you bring me through the whole chain of events to really show that this is going to bring money, right? If it's an economic value added. Smart cities look at KPIs a bit differently because they are here to serve the citizen. And so when you think about social innovation, it's a bit different. But one of the challenges that at least from an IOTA, IOTA is just a mini layer. It's a mini yeah, enabler. Totally. Right, so the solution, your KPI needs to be defined really as a solution. That's the distinction, right? Yes, yeah, yeah. I, I was about to say the same thing. Um, I, I have a lot of guys contacting me and they sort of want to solve everything with the IOTA protocol and that's not how it works and you won't be able to do it and it's going to be very hard to sell a solution that uh, over engineers to, to, sol to solve all of the problems with IOTA. IOTA is just a, just a distributed uh, data and value layer, but then you have all the hardware you need and you have a lot of things uh, on the middle. Uh, so yeah, uh, that, 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 that last part, I was about to say the same thing. So yeah, that's also- It, it starts also really with advice. the- It really starts with the problem worth solving, right? So yeah. I would argue that, you know, you have intuitively, uh, and you know how you could leverage on the tech, and that's awesome. But the way to qualify uh, <laughs> if it's a good project is like, is do you have a good problem to tackle? Right yeah. from a solution provider, you need to make sure that you have a real problem to tackle, and that you will have a client that will be delighted if you bring a solution. Yes. So that's the first step, right? And once you're in the field of solutions, then you can argue we have IOTA, it's open source, it's transparent and you can bring all those kind of added features but hmm. great yeah that's great so yeah i just want to add that uh, the iota evangelist network is is here just for this sort of thing so if you guys have uh have a startup and you want to start seeing whether iota is the way to go or not probably uh it's gonna it's not gonna be that easy to 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 get in touch with will but we will uh from the IEN, we will uh, be able to to analyze your project to to help uh, if if we see that uh, probably you are just uh, over engineering the IOTA part, and so that's that's one of our main uh, goals from the IEN. So I really I, I really want to encourage people to contact us uh, as a previous step, probably uh, to get in touch with the IOTA Foundation. Okay, yeah, that's, yeah. All, that's all. Yeah. Yeah. But I would say, I mean, in general, I think I have, uh, we have obviously gone through a phase of the development of the foundation and the tech that was a bit hard to, to, to tackle and embrace, you know, like everybody in the day to day. But I would love to be able to work on a format that is really inclusive. So some of the things I have myself, and those are thoughts, but in the smart city domain, it's, it goes back to one of the questions that were listed is like being able to shape an access to a test bed and and being able to articulate that thanks to the iota foundation and ecosystem we can bring a lot of talent right if you give us permission we could organize massive hacks hackathons and come and demonstrate all the potentials that are coming up from the ecosystem and uh, i i i've had those thoughts for for a long time it's just that we need to come at, come at, the, at a certain pace so first we need to sort of demonstrate that some of those things work at scale 
and then we have a structured process of engagement. We can't just come in and do some more yeah. uh, in and out type of engagement. So, but that's at least from my side a very strong motivation, and uh, I'd I'd love to be able to see a, a format where we can, you know, maximize the value for for everyone. Yeah, well, um, we will be in touch, and probably you can provide some input uh, to help us uh, uh, working on that. For sure. Okay. Well, uh, thanks a lot for for dedicating this time. Uh, this thanks is the to first you and everyone for being our online. first IEM talk uh, that is not that touchy, and hopefully we will we will have uh, many more. And also, thanks a lot to everyone who, who joined. And uh, this this talk is going to be as usual in our IEM YouTube. Uh, channel. Uh, once this finishes, it is already available there. So thanks again to everyone. Stay safe uh, and see you on the next IEM talk, guys. Bye. Cheers.